Dawn rises on a hot June day in 1996 over Matagorda Bay, Texas. Archaeologists are excavating the 58-foot French Bac Long ship that sank in 1686. A groundbreaking coffer dam was built for a scientific salvage operation that would allow shipwreck conservationists to rebuild the doomed ship, finally unlocking its long-held secrets. Austin, the capital city and cultural hub of Texas, finally marked a moment that marine archaeologists, divers, Texas state government agencies and private donors had been anticipating for 20 years since the discovery of one of the most important shipwrecks in American history. The hull of the La Belle shipwreck, painstakingly taken apart and put back together timber by timber, was gingerly placed in its final resting place at the Bob Bullock Texas State History Museum. A world-class exhibit will now house the remains of that ship and many of the 1.6 million artifacts found on board. These finds lay submerged on the floor of Matagorda Bay off the coast of Texas for over three centuries. Only today are historians unearthing the whole truth about La Belle, the small ship on a big secret mission to wrest territory from the Spanish. Its sinking changed the course of American history. There's no better way to learn about uh, historic shipbuilding than to re reverse engineer a ship that was built in the historic period. Seldom do you find the entire ship. You, you find what's left. And, 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 and nature preserved for us the bottom third of the hull with lots of cargo uh, in there. Uh, and I've, uh, that, that cargo represents a kit for building a colony in the 17th century New World. For nearly two decades, Dr. Jim Bruzeth and Dr. Peter Fix have been working on a project to salvage and restore La Belle and its artifacts. Fix is the head conservator in charge of the La Belle archaeological remains, while Brousseth, a marine archaeologist working for the Texas Historical Commission, took over the archaeological excavation soon after it began. Inside uh, La Belle, when we uh, excavated the, uh, the, the wreck, uh, we weren't certain what we would find. But as time went on, uh, we ended up finding over 1.6 million artifacts in what was actually the preserved bottom third of the hull. La Belle here behind me is just the largest of the artifacts. Uh, but all of these artifacts have been uh, uh, stabilized over the last uh, 17 to 18 years. I'm guessing right now that the total cost of La Belle from discovery all the way to where we are today, uh, building this, this beautiful exhibit at the Bullock Texas State History Museum, uh, is going to cost about $18 million. Brousseth vividly recalls how his team used ancient maps, journals, and a magnetometer during the initial search for the French explorer's ship. We decided we were going to go out and find La Belle. It took some time and uh, uh, took a few years and different tries, but eventually in 1995, we went out with our uh, boat, a uh, special boat that had an aluminum hull and it towed a magnetometer behind it, which is like a super sensitive metal detector. Shipwrecks such as La Belle contain many iron objects, from their bells to the bolts used to fasten the timbers together. That iron gave away its location. Chuck Mead was one of the divers looking for La Belle. Returning to the site of the La Belle discovery, he recalls how the equipment tipped them off. All we really knew is that there was a, a source of, uh, of magnetic uh, uh, magnetism. You know, there, were, there, were, there was iron somewhere on the seafloor. That's often a shipwreck, but it's often modern debris, something that we're just not interested in. Uh, so uh, we start sending divers down. And of course, we pretty quickly realized uh, what we had. Chuck's initial find in the murky waters of Matagorda Bay would make history. Here, 20 years later, 
he went back to see it. And then all of a sudden, I put my hand down on what feels like a metal handle. It's a solid, it's made of metal, it's attached to something big and heavy, and the very first thing I thought of was like, oh, could this be a cannon? And a few days later, we brought up this beautiful bronze cannon uh, with French wording on it. And we were very excited because we knew we must have an old shipwreck with a cannon, and it's got French writing, and there aren't that many French shipwrecks that have wrecked off the Texas coast. The stamp on the cannon had the mark of the Comte de Vermandois and a clearly defined serial number, which matched a ledger of weapons belonging to the French Navy at La Rochelle, France. That was the confirmation we needed that we had found La Belle, what has now become one of the great shipwreck discoveries in, in, in North America. Historians determined the ship was the La Belle, the hardy but small vessel that French explorer Robert Sieur de la Salle used to cross the Atlantic in search of the Mississippi River in an expedition that would last from 1684 to 1686. The team of divers found the cannon and several other small artifacts, but it was soon clear a larger, more complex operation would be necessary. Marine archaeologist Bato Arnold, credited with the La Belle discovery, decided to use a coffer dam, a circular dam that allowed for a dry archaeological excavation. The methods that are used to excavate an archaeological site, um, to accurately map in artifacts and record the timbers and other components and features of a shipwreck site, a lot of those methods were developed for high visibility shipwreck sites. And those methods can be very, very accurate and often are. But for blackwater sites, and this is the environment that Labelle is from, where you have zero visibility or less than six inches of visibility, those mapping techniques aren't feasible. We needed to do something different. A traditional underwater diving excavation, which would have been possible, would have been tough. Uh, archaeologists do that, but it would have been tough. And it would have been uh, more difficult to get small, fragile artifacts recovered. So we, we really thought in a way that hadn't been thought before anywhere in this hemisphere. And that was to build a what we call a coffer dam, a giant steel structure around it. And then we pump the water out. An engineer who specialized in oil rigs was given the job of designing the coffer dam. David Gann knew the area where the ship had sunk like the back of his hand. But he was familiar with how to, and had worked with uh, building uh, walls with sheet piling. Uh, but he had never built anything where, normally the sheet piling is used where you anchor it into land and you come out into the water. Here we were completely out in the middle of Matagorda Bay and we had to have the, uh, the sheet piling form uh, basically an oval in the water. In 1996, the coffer dam was built. Designed in an octagon, it was constructed to withstand the terrible storms and torrential rain and strong gales that are common in Matagorda Bay. The sheet steel piling used on the cofferdam was manufactured specially in steel plants in the state of Pennsylvania, over 2,500 kilometers away. And the steel sheets were made long enough so that they could be driven over 12 meters into the Matagorda Bay clay. They had to be able to place the sheet piling in such a way that where they started here and they worked on around, that last one had to be absolutely precise so it could slide right down into the place it needed to go. During construction of the cofferdam, crane operators used a machine called a mechanical vibrator to push these heavy sheets of steel into the bottom of the bay. Roughly two-thirds of the steel sheets were driven underground. Sand was deposited between the two sheet metal walls, 10 meters apart, to separate the center from the bay waters around it and to provide extra strength during storms. At 54 meters long and 40 meters wide, the coffer dam was said to be a gamble. After 1.1 million liters of water were pumped out, excavators and archaeologists could literally walk around and work on the floor of the bay discovering artifacts. Engineers knew that the cofferdam wouldn't be watertight, 
but hoped to avoid a bad leak that could be catastrophic to the conservation efforts. Once brought to the surface, the delicate organic material that had been preserved in the oxygen-free environments of the dense clay for centuries, like the rigging and the sails, could just crumble away. These objects were handled with extreme care by expert conservationists. Underwater archaeology or nautical archaeology, maritime archaeology, is the only uh, form of archaeology that has to have a conservator uh, attached to the project. And as we remove those artifacts and examine them, we realize what we had is what I call a kit for building a colony in the New World. These are the objects that an explorer coming to the New World in the late 17th century felt like he needed to build a successful colony. The colony kit, loaded on La Salle's four ships, included 2,700 pounds of raw iron stock for making and repairing iron tools, 650 pounds of steel stock, two sets of church furniture, around 600 pounds of tools for carpenters, tradesmen and craftsmen, and countless other provisions that were essential for building a colony. I mean, the colony kit, it's it certainly had the sort of day-to-day -day things you think of. There was a box full of cooking equipment. So you have brass colanders and brass pots and all the stuff you would have needed to cook. And they weren't part of the ship. I mean, these were things which they were bringing for the colony. We found uh, metal uh, candlestick holders. We found uh, dishes. We found um, uh, jars that contained medicines. Uh, we found the remains of the animals that they ate. We found the actual bones. Uh, including the, uh, the bones of the ship rat, the common ship rat. Um, and then you also have really what you need to build a colony. So you have casts full of nails. Um, they brought blacksmithing equipment, so when they got there they could take the raw iron they had and, and turn it into tools. And then they had pre-made tools, such as axes, which you know, they would have needed to cut down trees, work wood. So you have a lot of those type of objects. We have a lot of stuff that would have been used to build casks because, of course, that'd be a really important way to package anything. So you have a whole Cooper's bench, which was found in the hull. Um, you have Cooper's adzes and axes. Um, all the specialized equipment for those sorts of trades that in a colony you would need to establish because if you're going to be exporting materials, you've got to send them home in something. It was clear from these artifacts that this ship's remit was to establish a greater French presence in the New World, which at the time was up for grabs between the British, Dutch and Spanish, all Old World enemies of France. From 1996 to 1997, archaeologists and excavators took the one hour and 15 minute boat ride out to the Cofferdam twice a day from their headquarters in Palacios, Texas. Visitors came from all over the world to stand on the cofferdam walls and watch the archaeologists and volunteers find these amazing artifacts every day, with the waters of Matagorda Bay surrounding them on all sides. When we were, uh, when we were excavating uh, the Bell shipwreck, and of course we had the coffer dam out here, we had a 17-mile commute. And, and you know, usually we're, we're pretty exhausted uh, all these months of working, so we'd try to sleep if we could. So I got pretty good at sleeping in four or five foot seas. The wind and waves were a constant reminder of the tragic fate that awaited La Salle's expedition. I can remember as the sun set and our research vessel was on the horizon and things got uh, pretty quiet out here, it really felt like once you were alone on this very spot, you could really imagine what it was like uh, for these uh, French sailors and colonists who uh, I'm sure felt pretty alone <laughs> because uh, their home country was very far away and they were in a very uh, rough space. And uh, you, know, you think about their hopes and dreams. Uh, you think about those hopes and dreams being dashed to pieces when the ship ran aground to a shuddering halt right here on this spot where we are uh, right now. Uh, kind of sent chills uh, uh, down my spine. In 1996, archaeologists began a massive excavation and salvage project to conserve La Belle, a 17th century Parc Longue owned by King Louis XIV. Archaeologists needed to confirm their finds, so they asked archivists to scour French and Spanish archives for additional written sources. One of the few surviving French colonists' diaries was key. 
archival records are obviously very important for this. I mean, we're fortunate that we have, from the French, a number of archival documents, and we were assisted by two different researchers, uh, Bernard Ayer and John Debray, in the French archives looking up everything they could, and they found a lot of the information on the construction, um, letters of La Salle, um, hiring of different individuals who we know who they are now, we didn't know before, um, and then Jatel's diary, which had been published in the 1800s, or uh, like 1700s, um, I mean, provides this amazing insight into somebody who was really there and tells this really interesting story. Leading the expedition was the daring Frenchman La Salle, considered one of the most important explorers in American history. La Salle was from the city of Rouen, famous today for its beautiful cathedral. He left the Jesuit order to explore across the ocean from the French Atlantic coast. In the United States, La Salle is very famous. He's one of the great explorers. Uh, he did great deeds of exploration of the Great Lakes. He built the first sailing ship on the Great Lakes. Uh, he discovered the, uh, the mouth of the Mississippi River in 1682 and claimed all that land for France that later became the Louisiana Purchase, measurably adding to uh, the, the, the territory of the United States. Uh, the United States, in making that purchase, argued that Texas should be part of it because of La Salle being in here in Texas. So the Texas part of the uh, uh, overall La Salle explorations impacted the development of the United States as well. For the French at this time, they wanted access, better access to the Americas, better ports, um, particularly in the south, which aren't choked with ice um, in the winter. And, but this would be invading on Spanish territory. So especially at the time that La Salle's expedition set sail, there was conflict in Europe between France and Spain. and. Um, this was a way, in many ways this was a provocation if they got caught, but it was also an attempt on the part of the French to claim more securely lands that were in North America that would uh, provide them resources. La Salle had made a case to King Louis XIV that France could gain immense wealth by establishing this colony at the mouth of the Mississippi River that would be a major hub for French trade in the New World. The La Belle set sail in 1684 as part of an expedition that had around 400 passengers and crew, comprising soldiers, clergy, and colonists. La Salle came over with four ships. Uh, two ships, uh, La Belle and Le Charlie, were given to him by the king. He leased a, a, a third ship, Le Mab, from a, a merchant to bring over, and then the and a fourth ship he leased, uh, Saint Francois. Uh, so the four ships came over. Uh, he lost his first ship as he, he was in the Caribbean, stopping in, in today's Haiti. He stopped there for a period of time. And just before he did that, uh, the Saint Francois, which was a slower catch, that's the type of ship it was, uh, was captured by pirates or privateers. We don't know which, uh, but people captured it for the cargo, and we don't know what happened to the small crew that was on that ship. After the Saint Francois was taken, La Salle's company soon understood that this expedition would not be as easy as previously thought. So La Salle continued on from the Caribbean, uh, headed towards uh, the Mississippi River mouth, missed it, landed in the Texas coast with three ships. Uh, a second ship, Le Jali, had the orders to simply offload cargo, offload uh, colonists, and sail back to France. And it, it did do that after it was here on the, on the Gulf Coast for about three months, and it, it went back and made it successfully to France. La Jolie, the small fleet's gunship, abandoned the expedition to return to France. So ultimately, in late 1685, LaSalle was down to a single ship, La Belle, as his lifeline to get help if things went really bad for his colony. Losing Les Mables, prevented La Salle from perhaps completing a secret mission given to him by King Louis XIV, one that would have brought great wealth and revenue to France. The majority of the money coming out of the Americas was in the trade in animal pelts. Um, I think, and, I, and I'll quote him wrong here, but Louis XIV at one point made a comment that rather than animal pelts, he wanted silver from his colonies like, like the Spanish were getting. So aware that these materials were available in the Americas and having had very little success finding similar deposits up in the north, they took a strong interest in acquiring that land. La Salle had an assortment of firearms and arms material that he brought with them, 
that in addition to forming a colony um, in the Gulf, which was supposed to be at the mouth of the Mississippi, La Salle was also supposed to use this area as um, pretty much a, a staging area for maybe a later military engagement against the Spanish to try to take the Spanish mines. Geographical knowledge being as it was at the time, they didn't really understand the scale of what they were proposing. They, they didn't realize that, they, that it wasn't just an easy jaunt over to the, um, to the silver mines from the Mississippi. The colony kit, it turns out, also included over 400 firearms, as well as boxes full of swords and pole arms that were also recovered from La Belle's hull. With the guns, there were petards, which is um, a very small explosive device that is often used to be affixed to doors, to blow in doors um, in fortifications. So we had petards, we had fire pots, we have um, pole arms, these are um, edged weapons, uh, we have swords and these um, light muskets and, and buccaneer guns. Amy Borgens has photographed thousands of artifacts found in La Belle's hull. But firearms and weapons are her primary area of expertise. Actually, I love the fire pots. Um, for me, those were really exciting because it's a, you know, it's a, a, a very dangerous weapon. But the fire pots we have are explosive weapons. They're, uh, they contain a grenade. You know, some of them historically had uh, more of a flammable liquid, so that when you threw them and they broke, they may cause a fire, but they wouldn't e explode. They weren't explosive in the same way. So, but what I loved about it was. Um, the ceramic container itself, it just looks very benign and kind of harmless. I'm not aware of any place in the world elsewhere that they have been found together like that, that you can peer back into the mind of what a French explorer needed to build a colony in the New World. But those artifacts in total are an amazing collection to allow us to understand how these colonies in, in North America and, and throughout the Americas were, were uh, developed, and how they were supplied. And you, La Belle is absolutely unique in telling us that story. As archaeologists were uncovering the story of La Salle's presence in Matagorda Bay, word spread fast all over the world about the amazing artifacts being found in the cofferdam. La Belle's ownership came into dispute. A short time later, uh, a claim arrived at our offices from the French government, uh, a claim for La Belle. They said that La Belle uh, belonged to France, and they had submitted the claim to our U.S. State Department. The U.S. State Department forwarded the claim to our governor's office, and the governor's office sent it to my office. And at first, I was just, you know, really upset about this, that we found this ship in Matagorda Bay, an interior bay of the United States. How could it possibly be claimed? Uh, and, and this wasn't fair, I thought. La Belle is the property of the Republic of France. Um, we came to realize that um, thanks to research that established that this was part of what the King of France considered to be his, his uh, fleet. Uh, we researched it further and, and learned that they were claiming the ship under international law of the sea. And that law basically says if you have a vessel that's on an official naval uh, expedition authorized by the government, then no matter when the ship goes down, it's still owned by the, the flag nation, this, in this case France. So. When that came to light, uh, there, there was a discussion um, between France and the United States. And of course, the Texas Historical Commission, as the ones who discovered the ship and who recovered the ship from the bottom of the bay, uh, from the bottom of Matagorda Bay, um, that required a lot of negotiation, discussion. The United States, with the Texas Historical Commission, signed an international agreement with France that states the wreck of La Belle shall remain in the custody of the Commission for a period of 99 years from the date of entry into force of this agreement, which period shall be automatically renewed unless the parties agree otherwise. Meanwhile, in Texas, various experts at the Conservation Research Lab, as well as archaeologists, worked tirelessly to conserve not only the artifacts, but also the hull of La Belle in its entirety, after the ship's timbers were traced out on clear plastic sheets. Waterlogged wood is not a uh, material we generally think about for engineering. Uh, you wouldn't take this timber now and put it in your house as a foundation or uh, studs in the wall. 
uh, over time, uh, primarily through bacterial action, fungal action, a little bit of a um, so, uh, sort of a hydrolysis uh, process, the cellular structure begins to break down. In order to rebuild the hull of the ship, a carbon fiber and steel composite frame was built to support each timber. Custom steel bolts were used in the exact dimensions of the original holes that the 17th century shipwrights made while nailing the timbers together. If any of this timber were just to be brought out of the ocean, laid out on the deck in a matter of hours, depending on how hot and humid it was, uh, it would start to cup, it would start to move, it would dry out uncontrollably, and the forces and the tension on the degraded timber would uh, crack it, split it. Um, eventually, when it was really dry, there'd be no binding or little binding material involved. It would probably just powder to pieces in a lot of spots. Dr. Peter Fix has been working on the reconstruction of the Labelle shipwreck. In addition to being an expert in shipwreck timbers, he has worked for years in the conservation of the nearly 1.6 million artifacts found on La Belle. We have uh, processed all of uh, the materials coming from La Belle. That would involve bringing in, uh, accepting, documenting, uh, photographing, uh, drawing, sketching uh, the artifact as it comes into the lab. It may involve, depending on what it is, it may involve x-rays, it may involve further analysis through uh, spectrometry, uh, or uh, x-ray fluorescence or x-ray diffraction to determine what the uh, best way of stabilizing that material will be. Some of these items were so heavily corroded when they arrived at the a and research lab, it was difficult for scientists to determine exactly what objects they were. Most artifacts brought out of the ocean environment cannot easily stay intact without proper preservation techniques. When a concretion arrives at the lab, conservationists can use it like a mold to make a nearly exact replica of the artifact. To do this, they drill a hole in it and pour in a plastic epoxy. Once the plastic hardens, skilled workers take electric chisels and slowly chip away at the concretion. What is left inside is often a near-perfect cast of the original object. The Conservation Research Lab here in Bryan, Texas, uses electrolysis to remove corrosion caused by oxidization on iron, bronze and steel. Each tarnished artifact is submerged in a vat with a liquid containing a chloride solution. An electric pulse is sent through the vat, separating the corrosion from the artifact by changing the charge of the ions. This process attaches the corrosion to the charged ions, separating it from the artifact. The result makes the 300-year-old bronze cannon look newly forged. The lab is directed by one of the pioneers of these maritime archaeology conservation techniques. We had to keep in mind that this ship does belong to, the, uh, to, to France, and so we had to get an okay from France as to uh, the major conservation decisions we made. Uh, Dr. Donnie Hamilton has been doing this for 30 uh, some odd years now and is acknowledged as one of the experts in the field. And the Conservation Research Lab has probably processed more bulk um, materials than any other lab in the country. And it was decided a long time ago that we would do it by the, uh, the two-bath polyethylene glycol. Uh, polyethylene glycol, glycol, it looks like a wax, but it's water-soluble. And what it does, it just simply goes in as the water is re, is, uh, comes out, the polyethylene glycol goes in. And it just keeps the wood from shrinking and warping. Treating Labelle in a polyethylene glycol bath allowed the CRL to work on the conservation of the hull completely intact. Ideally, they would be able to do this process twice to allow the chemical to fully penetrate the timbers. Although the Conservation Research Lab had given Labelle's hull its first bath, 
The planned second bath of the polyethylene glycol, or PEG, would cost over a million dollars just to fill up the giant vat custom built for La Belle. To cut costs, the conservation research lab scrapped the second bath and decided to use a giant freeze dryer instead. It comes out with a, a much lighter color wood, a much lighter in weight wood, and each treatment, once you load the vat up, it only takes uh, essentially three to five months to treat it. If we had gone with the original treatment, it would have been a good two years before we had been finished. And so we switched from it. And a freeze drying is a very simple process. The wood would have to be put through the machine in different batches, each batch taking several months to go through the freeze drying process. So after reconstructing the entire ship's hull to get it through the PEG bath, they would have to take it apart again, piece by piece. In the freeze dryer, each timber was frozen. Once the timbers were frozen, the freeze dryer turned into a vacuum, turning the ice crystals in the wood directly into a gas. This process, like with freeze-dried food, is called sublimation and works to preserve these organic materials. Well, this is a big day in the conservation of the bell material. It started arriving from the excavation uh, primarily in the first part of 1997. So by May of 1997, all the artifacts had been delivered here for conservation. So now we've been conserving the artifacts for 17 years, and this is the last load of the, um, of the wood of the hull, and so to finish the uh, reassembly in the Bob Bullock Museum. Dr. Donnie Hamilton and staff are pushing the last lot of timber out of the freeze dryer to be packed up and loaded onto the climate controlled truck. After the freeze drying process, the timbers take on the hue or color that they would have had as brand new pieces of wood cut by the 17th century shipwrights. From here, the outer planking, which will be the most visible, was wrapped and transported from the conservation lab to the museum in Austin. When the timbers are finally put back together and bolted in place, the result of the conservation efforts is remarkable. To me, it's terribly exciting in that I'm not aware of any place else in the world people are putting together an ancient shipwreck and inviting the public to come and watch us, ask us questions, and let us tell them what we're learning by putting that ship back together. Here in Austin, Texas, Conservationists and maritime archaeologists have reverse engineered a 17th century ship once thought lost forever. Today, it is being pushed into the museum's main atrium. Extensive work has been done to reconstruct La Belle's hull the way it was found nearly 20 years ago at the bottom of Matagorda Bay. Holding it together, is a composite carbon fiber steel frame that is tilted 21 degrees. So when the masts are added and the ship is set, it will look like it did the day it sank. Journalists from around the United States are here to document the final step in La Belle's long, sad saga. As Dr. Jim Brzeth and Dr. Peter Fix move the entire hull into its final resting place. This ship is direct evidence of a major historical moment. Without this impetus, without this catalyst, um, I don't know what would have unfolded after um, many centuries. Um, if we would be as Hispanicized, we are Texans and as Hispanicized as we are, thanks to the French. <laughs> it was a game changer, it really was. La Belle is, is a shipwreck that changed Texas history uh, and American history to a certain extent. If, if La Belle had not gone down, La Salle's colony likely would have been successful. And our heritage, I think, in Texas today would be much more like New Orleans, where you have a French heritage as your past. The story of La Belle attracted New York Times best-selling author Stephen Harrigan, who traveled down to Fort St. Louis with Dr. Jim Brzeth to study the site of La Salle's failed attempt at the first European settlement in Texas. 
30 miles inland, up Gasitas Creek, near modern-day Port La Vaca, Texas, is where La Salle decided to locate his new colony. He chose this humid, mosquito-infested swamp because it was on the highest point around for optimal defense. Because the area is underdeveloped, the threat of rattlesnakes and alligators is constant. In case of encounter with these deadly animals, a herpetologist and an armed guard accompany the crew. In La Salle's colony, terrible mistakes put them in even more danger. The problem for La Salle is that when he was here, initially his interaction with the native Karankwa people was, was, was very positive. Uh, but at some point, some of his men stole some canoes from the Karankwa people. Uh, and that, that, that started the, uh, the animosity and, and the warfare between the French and the, uh, uh, the, the Karankawa people. You've got to look at it from the standpoint that the Karankawa, uh, they were a mobile people, and so those canoes were the very existence of their mobility. Here in this marshy land, the trees were thin and wispy, like overgrown weeds, mostly unsuitable for construction. With resources scarce, the Karankawas and French colonists alike struggled to find materials to build their communities. House and he used timbers from the uh, wreck of the ship Le Mab, one of his ships that wrecked coming into Matagorda Bay. But they were able to scavenge a number of the uh, the timbers from it, and he brought them up here and used to to build uh, his French uh, uh, building that was the main place where when the Indians would attack, the, uh, the settlers would all come and, and get into that building. Uh, he also cut down uh, trees that were some distance away and, and brought the timbers back here to add on to that structure. Thanks to Henri Joutel's surviving journal and letters, archaeologists and historians can paint a picture of what the conditions of Fort St. Louis would have been like in the autumn of 1685. One colonist died after being bitten by a rattlesnake. An alligator took another. Colonists learned to stay close to the buildings of their post. Unable to navigate up the shallow Garcitas Creek, La Belle was left in the deeper waters of the bay. In February 1686, a fierce storm blew in that forced the ship towards shallow waters and ran it aground. Most of La Belle's crew made it back to report the loss of the vessel, but one crew member perished. His skeleton was found in the hull centuries later. I, I'm, I'm convinced that even though uh, LaSalle would have eventually, uh, if, if LaBelle had not gone down and, and, and lost in a storm, would have found the mouth of the Mississippi River uh, and built his colony there, but I, I, I feel confident he would have kept something over in this area here, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, looking at a sort of a possible staging point for an uh, invasion into uh, northern Mexico. So uh, I think it's entirely reasonable in my perspective that if the French uh, settlement had lasted that our heritage would be more like New Orleans and, and we would have would not have the uh, Hispanic heritage that we have today. Steve, what's your take on all that? You're uh, no, writing I, a history I, of I, Texas. I, I, I think you're exactly <laughs> right. I think it's, this, is a, this is a pivot point of Texas history right here where we're mm -hmm. standing. You know, I mean, it could have gone French, could have gone Spanish. With their lifeline back to France severed, La Salle and some men, including Henri Joutel, began making their way towards the nearest French settlements, more than 2,000 kilometers to the north, in what is today Illinois. Once LaBelle went down in that storm with all of its uh, supplies for the uh, Mississippi River colony, uh, LaSalle knew that, that his colony was on, on the, the, the very edge of complete failure, and so that's when he decided he was going to have to take 17 men, leave this area, and walk to Canada to get help. On the way to Canada, things for La Salle took a turn for the worse. And as we know, on the way, his men shot him around Navasota, Texas, and that ended the French effort to, to colonize. So really, it, it, it's La Belle uh, and it's the sinking of that ship that, that changed our history. Stephen Harrigan believes La Salle's domineering personality may have led to him being killed by his own men. Definite explorer personality, too. I mean, he, mm. he has that in common with almost any of these guys, yeah, but that's... That's the drive. In his journal, Henri Joutel also wrote about the roses, 
brought from France and planted on site. Though the fort was burned down and most of the colonists massacred by the Karankawas, those rose bushes still grow wild to this day. Historical events oftentimes change on small issues small in small ways and here it's the sinking of a ship that changed our history from what might have been a French history and opened the door for a Spanish history and La Salle being in this part of the New World uh, that Spain claimed back in the 17th century and La Belle being here is what awakened Spain to realize that if they were going to hold on to what is today's Texas uh, and they had nobody up here occupying it, if they were going to hold on to this land, they needed to send people up here because the French would come back again and try and, and, and conquer and occupy this part of the New World. That is exactly what the French did in 1718, when the French Mississippi Company founded New Orleans. The French influence in Louisiana is still very visible today, in the architecture of churches and buildings throughout the southeast. La Salle is a hero here, revered as the first explorer to sail down the Mississippi all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Many French and Creole French speakers also moved to Louisiana, especially after the Haitian Revolution, leaving a mix of cultures brought from the descendants of Native Americans and African slaves brought over by the French. At night, New Orleans comes alive with the sounds and music preserved from this eclectic mix of cultures. A very different place from Texas. There's this mystique about Texas, and um, and there's, you know, for good or bad, they, they understand that we're about cowboys and cattle and all of that. Well, those are grounded in our Spanish heritage. Well, our Spanish heritage is as rich as it is in Texas because the Spanish found out that La Salle, this French explorer, had intruded on the territory of New Spain. The legacy of La Belle is of lasting importance, both historically and technologically. The sinking of this tiny vessel may have altered the course of history in the old and new world. The cofferdam was both a staggering feat of engineering and a gamble that paid off for archaeologists on this scientific salvage. The conservation strategies used to excavate and preserve the ship and all its artifacts will be used as examples of maritime archaeological techniques for decades to come. This is really a textbook example. I mean, there, you know, any student of marine archaeology, of shipwreck archaeology, is going to read about the bell, is going to learn about the bell. La Belle may have been a small ship, but she left a very large wake one that is still rippling across the world today.